Hey guys, and welcome to part one of this one part lecture series on bipedalism and Schmorl's nodes. Today we're going to be taking a look at how the evolution of humans into bipedalism led to several spinal problems, one of which being Schmorl's nodes. Schmorl's nodes, if you're unfamiliar, are a type of disc herniation, which if you remember back to our first lecture series on the back, specifically back video 04, we talked about how herniations can occur in the spine and what doctors will do to treat them. This is a different type of disc herniation, uh, but if you want to just review that video just so you have a little background information going in, then uh, feel free. But let's go ahead and get right into it. So first thing I want to talk about is just human evolution in general. Human evolution occurred very rapidly. Uh, we've only been around as modern Homo sapiens for about 200,000 years. While that might seem like a long time to you and me, it's actually very short time, uh, evolutionary speaking. If you think of animals like the alligator, who've been around for uh, 85 million years, then you start to realize that we've only been around for a very short amount of time. Uh, and if you were to trace back our lineage back about a few thousand years, or a few million years, sorry, not a thousand, <laughs> a few million years, you'd eventually come across uh, what's known as the lowest common ancestor between us and chimpanzees and bonobos, which are our closest living relatives. Uh, before that split, we were all just one species. So all of our uh, present day chimps, bonobos, modern humans, and Neanderthals, which are no longer around, but all of those came from one single uh, species that split into branches, uh, split into two branches, and then split furthermore. Uh, but after the, uh, those branches split, many adaptations occurred uh, since then, uh, leading to the differences that you can see between us and our uh, pan uh, relatives over there. Uh, so to understand this uh, evolution, one should probably be pretty familiar with natural selection and Darwinian natural selection theory of evolution. According to Darwin, some individuals are better adapted for environment uh, than others. Individuals that are better adapted are going to have traits and characteristics that increase their evolutionary fitness, which they're going to be able to pass on to future generations. That's called selecting for. And individuals that uh, have traits that decrease their evolutionary fitness or even just don't uh, have the that added beneficial increase in evolutionary fitness, they're going to be selected against. So individuals that have desirable traits, you're going to see those traits uh, in future generations. Uh, all different types of traits can be selected for or against. Skin color, intelligence, even spinal shape can all be selected for or against. Uh, the more beneficial or harmful a trait is, the greater degree nature selects for or against it. That just basically means that... Um, if a trait is very beneficial, you're going to see a lot more people with it. If a trait is very harmful, you're going to see a lot less people with it or individuals, depending on what species you're looking at. So then let's get into the evolution of bipedalism. So that's one of those traits that uh, was heavily selected for uh, in the early uh, stages of the genus Homo. Uh, bipedalism was beneficial for several different reasons. One of the biggest reasons was it allowed humans to carry tools. Uh, humans really need tools because they don't have the uh, fangs, claws, or any really natural defense or attack mechanisms that they can use for hunting and defense from animals that are hunting them. Uh, so animals that were able to carry tools, use them, manipulate them while moving, that was very beneficial. So it just increased their chances of survival. As well as when uh, humans began to disperse, uh, spread her out and explore new lands, they had to um, traverse long distances and walking and running. That's uh, it takes a strain on your the body when you're going uh, long distances. So uh, bipedalism allowed for quicker movements and eventually running uh, to get across those large open plains, which also helped individuals survive as they were able to get away from some dangerous predators. Uh, the tool use coupled with being able to run long distances is what some people believe allowed for our ancestors to begin to grow larger brains, which eventually led to communication and more sophisticated tool use and then led into us today. Um, because this trait was so beneficial, it was heavily selected for, as I mentioned earlier. So many individuals started uh, becoming bipedal. 
uh, in future generations as the uh, bipedal organisms were very, uh, they were much better at passing on their genes and traits than their uh, quadruped counterparts. Uh, talking about quadrupeds, uh, we can kind of get into the evolution of the spine. So the spine, as you can kind of see in this uh, primate uh, skeleton, you can see that uh, primary curvature, which is just that one single curvature that goes from the head down to the uh, pelvis. Uh, that's what human spines used to look like. That's what quadrupeds look like because those quadrupeds, they walk on all fours. So that weight is distributed between all four of their limbs. But in humans, uh, they developed a what's called secondary curvature, if you remember from that first series of lecture videos, with that lumbar curve right here. That lumbar curve is very important as it allows for the center of gravity to be directly located over the feet, which was very important for walking and uh, running. And it also uh, required less muscular effort for walking. So individuals who had that new spine shape were able to uh, walk and run further without expending as much energy. So with this rapid evolution came some pretty serious problems, just as uh, humans today, when they evolve to, or when they are going through growth spurts rapidly, you can see some pretty, uh, pretty painful injuries, especially in adolescents uh, who have open growth plates. So with these growth plate injuries, I can kind of move myself out of the way here so y'all can see a little bit. Uh, you can kind of see here, Osgood Schlatter's of the knee uh, Islin's disease of the fifth metatarsal and Seaver's disease of the calcaneus. They're all growth plate injuries in which there's this tendon that attaches at this muscle attachment site and pulls on these open growth plates. You can kind of think of it as like a wall, uh, which is the growth plate, plaster wall, and then a steel cable, which is that muscle and tendon. If you pull on that steel cable and you keep pulling, keep pulling, uh, which is what happens during a growth spurt, the, uh, muscles get tighter and they pull, pull and pull and it makes little cracks in that wall. And the, uh, to repair that, you if it's a real wall, you use spackle, but the bone will reossify and you can get these little bumps and ridges that uh, protrude, especially you can see it a lot in Osgood Schlatter's. There's a pretty substantial knee protrusion that can occur here. Uh, but basically it's just because the body's growing pretty rapidly and the, um, uh, tendons aren't expanding and stretching out. So they're putting a lot of stress on it. It's just that rapid growth um, and rapid change without enough time to adapt causes injury. In the same way, you can kind of see that with the evolution of a species. If a species doesn't have enough time to adapt to changes that they're seeing, uh, there's going to be some problems that appear, clinical, clinical painful problems. Uh, not all these individuals are going to experience them. Some are going to be better adapted. Some are going to be worse adapted. Just the same way not all people experience these growth plate injuries. It just depends on what's going on in the individual's body. So now we're going to talk about uh, Schmorl's nodes, which are one of the problems that has arisen from the evolution of bipedalism. So you can kind of see this is a standard disc herniation. This is a Schmorl's node. Schmorl's nodes are disc herniations where the nucleus pulposus leaks into the uh, uh, vertebrae. That should say vertebrae right there. Vertebrae. Not disc. Leaks into the vertebrae above or below it. Whereas in a standard disc herniation, you're going to have it leak out into that intervertebral canal um, or the uh, spinal, leak into the spinal canal. Yeah. It's uh, we're that it can do a lot of damage there, but luckily with Schmorl's nodes, because they're leaking into the uh, actual vertebrae, they're not really running into those nerves or blood vessels or anything that are in that canal. So they're generally uh, not as painful. They're going to have less symptoms, um, but it's still a disc herniation and it could still be kind of dangerous. Uh, when you do feel pain, it's generally going to be found locally where the Schmorl's node is, and it's just going to be because of the inflammatory response or immune response that kind of tries to uh, prevent the spread of that Schmorl's node. Uh, but because most of them are asymptomatic, they're generally going to be found incidentally, meaning a doctor is going to have an x-ray of a spine and they're going to see them. They'll be like, ah, oh, look, 
uh, you have some Schmorl's nodes there, they're usually not uh, going to be uh, looking for them specifically unless it, extreme rare cases with chronic uh, spinal pain. Just like, uh, as can be seen here, not all nodes range from, uh, or not all nodes are uh, asymptomatic. Some can cause mild pain, some can cause moderate pain, and some can cause severe chronic back pain with spinal degradation, just depending on the size of the node. So right here, that's kind of a minor schmorl's node. This one's getting to be a little more dangerous where it starts to get bigger and bigger and digging really into that uh, vertebrae. So causes of schmorl's nodes, uh, biggest cause is axial loading trauma, uh, just compression of the spine. That's where you can get head blows, uh, diving into shallow water, jumping off a high surface, anything that really compresses that spinal cord. is going to kind of tear away at that annulus fibrosis bordering the vertebral body end plate. And that nucleus pulposus is just going to leak out either above or below, depending on where that tear is. And it can start leaking into those uh, vertebrae, which can be potentially dangerous. And now, uh, kind of tying it all together with that predisposition to development of the Schmorl's nodes, uh, as we were saying earlier, not all spines are the same shape. Not all are going to have vertebrae that are the exact same shape. Human bodies, they've evolved, and some are a little more evolved than others. Uh, some have adaptations that allow them to handle bipedalism better than others. The lumbar curve, if there's a spine that is more similar in shape to a chimpanzee's and has less lumbar curve, then that center of gravity is not going to be uh, ideal. There's going to be more stress and wear and tear on the back. And with that uh, increased stress and wear and tear, you're going to have those that annulus fibrosis getting kind of compressed. Those discs are going to have to do more work keeping the uh, spine uh, in that upright vertical position. And that more work when you keep rubbing and grinding uh, because of the uh, shape of the spine, and uh, when that happens, you can get those tears, and uh, you're usually still going to need a traumatic spinal injury. But because the discs are have experienced more wear and tear, they're weaker and uh, are more prone to tearing. So because uh, some individuals have not had the uh, time to have, uh, or because human spines have not had enough time to adapt to become perfect. There's still some people who are more prone to developing these Schmorl's nodes that their backs are not able to handle the stresses of bipedalism. To identify Schmorl's nodes, like I said earlier, you're generally going to see them in an x-ray or an MRI. Here you can see them in a x-ray. There's one right here, one right there, a couple in this one above and below. So you can definitely tell that individual had a compressed spine. Right here you can see it in this MRI where it's just leaking down to this one below with the healthy vertebrae above it. And then treating Schmorl's nodes, um, because they're generally asymptomatic, you're generally not going to need treatment. Doctors are still going to want to monitor them though, because just as they're not asymptomatic, or just because they're asymptomatic when they first appear, doesn't mean they're going to stay that way. It is a herniated disc, and if that nucleus pulposus continues to leak out into the uh, vertebrae, then they could become problematic. They could get that uh, immune response and inflammation that causes that back pain, and if they get severe enough uh, and are threatening of breaking down the spinal cord, a discectomy might be required, and a disc, discectomy may be required uh, with spinal fusion. So this right here, it's kind of showing a typical disc herniation where that nucleus pulposus leaks out into that spinal canal, but uh, you're generally going to see the same uh, treatment where the disc is going to be removed if it's chronic, and then the spine is going to be fused together to uh, make sure that disc is no longer needed. But that's about it. In sum, human evolution has resulted in several drastic changes over a short period of time. Uh, bipedalism is one of those. It was heavily selected for as uh, humans experienced great uh, benefit to being able to walk upright and manipulate tools. Because of its rapid evolution, some individuals are better adapted to bipedalism than others. That's because of their spinal shape and uh, differences in uh, vertebral shape. Uh, the individuals who are uh, have better evolved spines and are more characteristic of healthy humans are not as likely to develop Schmorl's nodes, whereas individuals who are uh, with less evolved spines and that appear to have more similarities with ch our chimpanzee and bonobo relatives are more likely to develop Schmorl's nodes. And just because these nodes are generally asymptomatic, 
does not mean they should be overlooked as they do require some serious treatment sometimes.